so we're kind of talking again here about Native American power in the United States. Um, we haven't talked about the natives here in a little bit. I mean, we've kind of really been focused on the growth of the nation, the, Amer the American Revolution. Um, we did note, and you might, you know, just kind of remember this just for general purposes, maybe not for this quiz, but that um, the Native Americans fought on the side, most of them fought on the side of the British during the American Revolution because they thought that if the British won, that that would give them favor. And they thought, like most of the rest of the world did, that the British had no chance of losing. And so when they pick that side and the Americans end up winning, that's going to cause some major problems to kind of occur. Uh, and the natives and the, and the colonists and now the American citizens had had plenty of struggles b before. And you kind of harken back to like Pontiac's War and some, some of those uh, ideas where Shays' Rebellion, some of these things, or not Shays' Rebellion, uh, Bacon's Rebellion, all kind of stemmed with problems with the Native Americans. So we're going to kind of touch back and see kind of where they are at here. Now, Jefferson's rhetoric of equality, you know, and he's like, hey, everybody should have an equal say. That kind of doesn't mesh very well with the reality that the nation was actually kind of going through, um, especially when it came to gender and race and class and ethnicity, particularly with the Native Americans. And uh, the diplomatic relationship between the natives and the, the state and local governments and national government uh, was a really dramatic example of the dangers that could happen when you have inequalities like they do in the United States. Um, prior to the revolution, many uh, Native nations had balanced this delicate diplomacy between the European empires uh, which scholars now call the playoff system. And you need to know for quiz purposes what the playoff system is. Basically, they kind of played the European powers back and forth against each other to try and get the best deal they could, right? Um, because the European powers, you had France and England and the Dutch and, and, all, and the Spanish all kind of intermixed in those open frontier. Now, it's pretty much just America. And so this playoff system is really not going to work as much anymore. Um, Americans are going to push for more land, and their interactions with the natives and their diplomats and leaders are going to become more aggressive. Uh, boundaries were just one source of tension, but trade and cr criminal jurisdiction, like who could, who could charge a Native American for a crime, roads, the sale of liquor, and alliances were also kind of key negotiating points between the natives and the Americans. Now, despite their role in fighting on both sides, uh, more so on the British, but they did fight with the Americans in some cases, the Native American negotiators were really not at all included in the diplomatic negotiations between England and America to end the war, right? And that really kind of ruffled their feathers a little bit. Um, they said, hey, you know, the ones that did fight with America and sided with America that said, hey, we sided with you. We should, we should get something out of this. We fought with you against the British. And the Americans basically took the stance of, well, we appreciate that, but you're savages, and this stuff is really too complex for your brains to understand anyways. So why don't you just sit back and relax? Um, and that's not really a good you know, way to handle people because they don't like it. Uh, the white people's ridicule of, you know, indigenous practices and their disregard for their uh, property rights and uh, their sovereignty really prompted some of these indigenous people to turn away from, you know, white people altogether and start looking to replace uh, the, the losses that had been done in their own culture. So Native American diplomats, you know, they continued to maintain and develop relationships with the United States. And they also tried to cease relationships with the British Empire. And they also began making even tighter relationships with other native nations. Um, formal diplomatic negotiations between the natives didn't really help reestablish um, relationships between the average person, though. So while the leaders of the Native Americans were you know, in negotiations with the government of the United States, the average American citizen and the average Native American were not getting along any better at all. Um, throughout the early republic, though, this diplomacy, you know, was kind of preferred to war, right? The, nat the natives 
don't want to go to war with the United States. The United States doesn't want to go to war with anybody. And while they kind of hold it against the natives for fighting against them, they don't want to fight, they don't want to risk more lives in war, right? So diplomacy really allowed these parties to air their grievances and negotiate relationships and minimize the violence, but it's going to fall apart. Diplomacy is not going to hold up for very long, and ultimately, when diplomacy failed, violence occurred. And, um, you know, the problem with a lot of the, the, the interactions was that Native people were asked to basically negotiate as groups, right? So they say, hey, we're going to negotiate with the Native tribes of Ohio, and we're going to lump you in all in the same group. Well, the problem is there might be 50 groups in Ohio, and they don't all have the same needs or wants or whatever. And so it's a lot more complex than that. Where the United States is negotiating from a standpoint of federal government, one people, one nation, they, want to de they don't want to write 400 treaties. So they go, hey, we're going to just block all of y'all together, and then you all get the same thing. Well, that's not going to work very right, very well, and it's going to make a lot of these people mad. And uh, one of the people that ends up saying, hey, you know what? If they're going to group us together, we should team up and then take them out. If they're going to make us basically by treaty be one people, let's get some treaties together and actually combine forces and overthrow these jokers because we're tired of them anyway. And one of the people that does this is uh, a Shawnee leader called Tecumseh. Now, that's kind of a famous name. Uh, like, later on, you're going to end up with a guy, called, his name is William Tecumseh Sherman, and he's the guy that burns the South uh, during the Civil War, Sherman. And then they name a tank after him, but his middle name was Tecumseh, uh, named after the Native American leader. <coughs> Not that that had... That, that has anything to do with anything. But Tecumseh, for quiz and test purposes, you need to know who that guy is. Um, he and his brother, uh, Tinskawatawa, Tinskawatawa, um, they, who, and his brother, Tinskawatawa, was a prophet. Remember back in Pontiac's War, it started with Neolin, right? And Neolin was a prophet. Well, Tinska Wadawa was um, a prophet as well. And they envisioned an alliance of North American indigenous populations that are going to halt the encroachments of the United States. And they create pan-Indian towns. And this is what you need to know for purposes. This becomes a major movement. But it starts in Indiana. That's where Tecumseh really starts this alliance at, is in Indiana. Indiana, OK? Now, um, it starts in Greenville and then at Prophetstown. Um, and this was all in defiance of a treaty that said, you know, you can't have Native American alliances within American territory. And they're like, well, we're going to do it anyways. Okay, and so Tecumseh travels to many, you know, travel to a lot of diverse native tribes all the way from Canada to Georgia. He calls for unification and resistance and restoration of sacred power, right? Their, their confederacy was really the culmination of a lot of movements that had swept through uh, the indigenous uh, North America during the 1700s. Uh, like, like I said, the Pontiac's War and Neolin, the, who was the Delaware prophet, um, or, you know, and he had his visions of native independence and cultural renewal and religious revitalization. And um, if you remember that story, just to recap, Neolin, and uh, he spoke to the master of life, right, the great spirit, and he urged native people to shrug off their dependency on European goods, assert their faith and spirituality and rituals, cooperate with one another against the white people's ways. And he, at the time, advocated against violence against the, against the British on native lands. And that really escalated after the Seven Years' War. His message was really you know, effective. And so between 1765, Neolin, and 1811, 
other native prophets had carried this message and kept it alive and encouraged indigenous people to kind of you know, push back against the white people, push back against them trying to steal our culture. Um, and I mean, countless of them. Well, you finally get to Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Tenskwatawa. It's too many vowels. Um, they have so many. And um, they articulate these, you know, ideas and beliefs of their predecessors. And in particular, Tenskwatawa uh, pronounced comes out and he says that the master of life talked to him and entrusted him and Tecumseh with the responsibility of returning native people to the one true path and ending all native communities, you know, corruption by European American trade and culture. He said that, you know, there's this deep need for cultural and religious renewal and that 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 we should blend together our native cultures to some extent and drive out Christianity. So if on the quiz you're maybe asked like, hey, what was really the main message of Tecumseh and his brother? That would be really the most effective thing that they preached was religious revival, religious fervor, right? This idea of spirituality being the driving force behind getting these people to unite. And um, yeah, the cultural and religious revitalization was revitalization was extremely empowering and and to and liberating to a lot of the people, uh, the native people of the of America. Uh, his Confederacy really drew heavily from indigenous communities in the old Northwest, and they really festered hatred for the land hungry Americans. He attracted a wealth of allies because he refused to give up any land. So the Americans would come in and say, hey, let's sign a treaty. We don't have to fight. We don't have to go to war. You give us a, half the land that we really want, and we'll hold off war. And he'd be like, I ain't going to give you nothing. Not one blade of grass. And the fact that he was willing to go to war and fight against these people really brought a lot of people to his side. Um, and so that kind of... Yeah. Um, again, he claimed that the master of lies had, had given him these instructions. And um, unfortunately, it kind of, this idea of really pushing spiritual change, and they basically, it ends up being, hey, any Native American who is a Christian, right? Now, you, there were Natives who believed in Native rights and, and, and Native land, and, but they had been drawn to Christianity. Well, Tecumseh comes in and says, no, if you're, you're either 100% with us or 100% against us. If you accept anything from the white people, including Christianity, you're not part of us. And it leads to these witch hunts and like this, this idea of like, oh, we got to find the Christians in, in our midst. And, you know, hey, are you buying whiskey? If you're buying whiskey from the white people, then you're bad, right? Like it, it becomes this internal conflict as they try to rid themselves completely of, of white influence. And when, by bringing everybody together, he himself also starts to tear them apart to some extent, um, which is kind of sad. But he's so successful in bringing people together that other tribes then take the stuff that him and his brother are doing and they spread it like you have the, uh, the Red Stick Creek Indians. Uh, they go and spread it to the southeast. Uh, and you have all different kinds that are just really pushing this idea um, out. Now, unfortunately, when we get to it eventually, Andrew Jackson's not putting up with none of that uh, when he gets elected president later on. And that falls apart pretty quick. But just understand that other tribes really extend this view of Tecumseh further than what Tecumseh was even trying to stretch it. Not everybody was on board, though. Uh, some people wanted to remain loyal. Some natives said, hey, we're OK with America. And so some, the fail, after the failures of the, the Pan-Indian unity and they lose a battle at uh, Tippecanoe, uh, Tecumseh's confederation kind of falls apart. Then 
when the War of 1812 happens, the U.S. and Britain offer new opportunities for Tecumseh and his followers, right? Because he now sees the British are going to fight against the Americans too. We'll join up with them. But then the British lose again. This dude, they just couldn't catch a break. You know, honestly, the native population of America just really couldn't catch a break. They kept picking the wrong sides. Um, and so eventually Tecumseh, uh, you know, says, hey, we're determined to defend our land, and we're going to, you know, if we have to, we will fight till the death, and that's exactly what Tecumseh does. He fights to the death on uh, the battlefields of uh, Moravian Town, Ontario, some French town sound in, in October of 1813, pretty much um, that spelled the end of the main push in the early 1800s against uh, American colonization further west. But the stories that had spread even further west into the Great Plains with the Comanche and the Apache, this idea of resistance, and, and that becomes a major factor in the next over the next century as, as North American, as the Americans try to continue to extend their, their land that way. All right, and then the last section here talks about the War of 1812. I'll be as brief as I can because, but you do need to know like the War of 1812 was pretty important. Um, Jefferson had basically left office in 1808. Congress ends the embargo. British kind of relaxed their policies towards American ships. Um, and even after all of that, it still looks like we're going to have to fight Britain again. Um, America had really got tangled up in two really distinct things. Uh, first, they had really tried to stay neutral. And we talked about the embargo where they tried to stay neutral and nobody was buying it. Uh, and it really just ended up making people more mad at us than anything else. And so British are mad at us about that. Secondly, um, we still got leftover issues with Britain from the Revolutionary War. At the, the, the treaty that ended the revolution said that Great Britain had to abandon all their posts in North America. But there were still like 30,000 redcoats in North America by 1812. I mean, you're talking 40 years after the war ended. They hadn't given up their military posts. So th there's tensions here for sure. Also, you need to understand that impressments, for quiz purposes really, one of the major conflicts that led us to the War of 1812 was the fact that the British kept drawing people into their navy. Now, America's economy had really grown, and part of that had been the fact that if our American economy is growing with trade, we really need more sailors. We were paying a lot of money for to be a sailor on one of these trade ships. And what was happening was British people were going, you know, British sailors were going, well, they're making double what I'm making. I'll go to America, get on one of their ships, and I'll make double what I'm making here, right? And so they would go to America and say, hey, I'm not British anymore. I'm an American, and join one of these trade boats. Well, the British didn't see it that way. In fact, by 1803, about 30 to 40 percent of every sailor on an American merchant ship was British. Like, a lot of them. Well, England's in a bunch of wars at the moment. They need sailors, and, and thousands and thousands of them have escaped to America to just make money. So when you look at it that way, if you're a British Navy ship and you come across an American ship and 40% of the crew is British, you're like, hey, y'all are coming back to Britain with us. We need y'all more than they need you. So you're going to be in the British Navy now. Well, the problem was they'd also take the Americans. And America was like, hey, dude, you can't do that. Like, we're, we don't want to be in your Navy, right? But um, it, it became pretty clear the British didn't care. They were trying to win their wars. So again, between 1803 and 1812, almost 6,000 Americans were forced into the British Navy. That's a lot. Um, and then they start seizing our ships. We're sending trade goods, 
Britain says, if you want to trade in Europe, you have to stop in Britain first and then go from there. We say, we're not doing that. So the British start seizing our ships. Then the French get mad because the French are like, you're sending ships to Britain? How dare you? And they start seizing our ships. And we're like, guys, this is, this is unacceptable. Um, we're very angry about it. And Americans are very angry about it. Um, they, they think that basically... Um, by the time we decide that we're going to fight against Britain on this, that we'd probably lost somewhere around like $108 million worth of goods, which is a lot, like at that time. So you're talking like, like billions and billions of dollars worth of stuff had been just stolen from us. We're like, guys, this ain't going to happen. Um, the Atlantic Ocean to the American frontier, they were at odds with the British Empire. Um, for quiz purposes, you know, one of the main things that made people on the frontier mad with the British is that they were giving guns to the natives. The British were literally giving guns to Tecumseh. Those people that we were just talking about fighting against the Americans, they were being given all their weapons by the British. And the Americans were like, hey, stop doing that. The British were like, oh, we're not doing anything. Don't know what you mean. They're like, bro, that's a British gun that, that that savage over there is holding. What are you doing? Oh, they must have just taken that out of the shed or something. I don't know. Sorry. We wasn't having none of that. Um, so we end up getting pretty mad about that. All of this basically is going to lead to the fact that we want to go to war. And you go, well... Okay, but the American Constitution says you can't just go to war. Congress has to say you can go to war. Well, the good news is, by 1812, the Republican Party holds 75% of the seats in the House of Representatives and 82% of the seats in the Senate, and they basically can do whatever they want. And the Republicans, remember, they're the party of the people, and the people want to go to war. And so, you have a group of people known as the War Hawks, and they're basically, they were too young to remember the horrors of the American Revolution, but they were young enough to remember their fathers and grandfathers fighting in it and having pride in fighting the British. And they're like, we want to fight the British. And they decide, we're going to war. And so, um, convinced by these war hawks in his party, President uh, Madison drafts a statement of national dispute with Great Britain, and Congress asks, and he asks Congress for a declaration of war on June 1st of 1812. Uh, you know, they hoped that this would maybe push the British out when they got word of it, but by June 18th, Congress passes it, and we're at war with Great Britain. There's two key players, the United States and Great Britain. It also brought people in from the Native American tribes. It was fought in three main stages, the Atlantic Theater, Offenses against Canada and the Great Lakes, and then the Southern Theater. So the Atlantic Theater, that's really, like, that was more of a sea battles. And, um, you know, the Americans were really interested in the Great Lakes and along their border, uh, and they outmatched the natives and the British there. So that was a really successful campaign. The Atlantic Theater was a really bad campaign because our Navy sucked. Um, and so we really, really... But we, our, our, Navy, our Navy was really just a bunch of merchant ships. And they were mad that British had been taking all their soldier, all their sailors and making them go join the British Navy, right? And so they were pretty motivated, but we didn't have a Navy, really, that was worth a flip. And so the British really dominated the uh, naval battles for a while. Um, really, for the most part. Um, until we finally built up enough ships in our Navy to really actually, like, stand up against them. Um, once Napoleon actually folds in France and Britain wins that war, though, they can turn their full attention to the War of 1812. They send their whole Navy over. They blockade Washington, D.C. They burn the White House to the ground. Um, but it was, it's, it was not really... Um, we didn't really have a chance against their Navy at all. Uh, luckily, they didn't stand a chance against us on the ground, and they end up um, 
suing for peace, essentially. Um, the third thing, really, though, like I said, they burned Washington in 1814. The British then go towards New Orleans. They win a naval battle, but then they set up in New Orleans, and we send this guy down there uh, called Andrew Jackson. And um, he didn't give a crap. He, he went down there and smoked the British in New Orleans. And then uh, that dude wrote that song about it. Um, huh? No, no. Like Johnny Horton, the Battle of Eight, the Battle of New Orleans. Yeah. In 1814, we took a little trip along Colonel Jackson down to mighty Mississippi. You don't know that song? Oh. Well, yeah. It said that they fired their cannons till the barrels melted down, so they grabbed an alligator and they shot another round. That's funny. That's a funny joke. They were shooting cannonballs out of alligators. That's funny. Anyway, uh, they, what's, what's really funny about that battle is that by the time Andrew Jackson actually gets to New Orleans, uh, we had already signed a treaty with Britain. So Andrew Jackson just beat him up because he could, which is great, um, to be honest, because heck with the British. They suck. Um, not everybody supported the war. Um, in fact, there was a group of Federalists that met in Hartford, Connecticut. You need to know about the Hartford Convention here uh, for quiz purposes. They produce a document that says uh, that they want to abolish the three-fifths cop rule about the southern slaveholders. They want to limit the president to one term. And they said that you should have a two-thirds congressional majority instead of just a 51% vote to declare war and admit new states. Okay. And so they thought that if they could do this, that they'd be able to limit the power of the Republicans more. But nobody really took this serious because the Federalists had no power and nobody liked them anymore. And so uh, the problem really was, though, that the Republicans were bolstered by this win of Jackson in New Orleans. And um, then they signed the Treaty of Ghent. And it looks like, well, the Republicans declared war. And then we win the war. The Federalists were saying, hey, we're losing the war. We, sh we shouldn't just allow the Republicans to just send us to war anytime they feel like it. And then we win the war, and everybody's like, well, why not? We just won. What are you all complaining about? This is great. Um, so yeah, they don't, they don't really get anything done ever again because they are stupid. Because the Federalists, who you know, basically become the elite Democrats, um, they're the ones who think that you're too stupid to rule your own country and that rich elite people who are more educated than you and know more about life should tell you what to do because you're not smart enough to, to rule yourself. Thanks. Uh, the treaty of the U.S. between the U.S. and Great Britain basically took us back exactly where we were before except the British actually had to leave. Um, it really more than anything, though, strengthened American nationalism. It fostered a sense that the country had really been reborn and was stronger than ever. Um, and you need to know that that was really the major outcome of the War of 1812 for quiz purposes, that it reinforced American sense of national pride and the importance of having economic freedom. Um, and so that's, that's kind of really, more than anything, it was a very short war that cost us more than it cost the British, but the British just didn't want to fight us anymore, honestly. They were kind of over it, and we were kind of over it. And then Colonel Jackson went down the mighty Mississippi and fought the bloody British in the town of New Orleans, and they gave up and left. Yeah. Um, one of the other main things here, though, is that James Monroe gets, becomes president. And because of all this stuff and people not taking our neutrality serious, he basically issues one of the most important documents that had ever been issued in American history. And so this is going to come up later, and we're going to talk about it more in depth, but I do want you all to understand something right now. He issues something called the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine basically is the most important foreign policy document that has ever been issued by the United States. And here's what it basically said. Hey, all you European countries, are you all tired of getting whooped? Because if you are, then keep your tail out of North America, out of the entire 
hemisphere. We don't want you over here at all. North America, South America, uh-uh. If you come over here and deal with any of this, you're going to get the American boot up your tail from here on out. And we ain't going to get involved in any of your stuff. Don't ask us to. Don't send us no letter talking about Napoleon's back. We don't care. We're going to hang up the phone. Okay? We ain't listening. So we're going to take care of everything over here. Y'all fight y'all's little wars over there and leave us alone. That policy basically dictates all foreign policy for the next 150 years until World War I, World War II. We basically say, y'all got so many problems, y'all can work that out, and y'all leave us alone. Period. And that was really James Monroe. And um, it was really, really impactful. And we'll get into the impact of that probably in the next chapter as well.